Mike. Bob, we got about a minute. Is that crowd argument resonating with you at all? Absolutely not. Not after this point in time. First of all, let's remember Mr. Floyd was in handcuffs. And these analogies, if there was a shootout and somebody was having a heart attack, fell flat on their face. This prosecutor did an excellent job. we got to give him credit for bringing each and every step of the way, dismantling this argument about the crowd, as well as the uh, drug intoxication. None of that makes a difference when one of their very own is saying the knee should have come off the neck. He basically confirmed what everyone else so far has testified to as to policy, and that goes to second-degree murder. We will talk further about this key testimony, but it also gets into how the officers dealt with him throughout this uh, event. They couldn't find a pulse, but yet remained on him to the point where paramedics are arriving, and some, one believed he was already dead. That huge testimony and much more coming up as we recap a huge day. Stay with us. Welcome back to HLN and our continuing coverage of the Derek Chauvin trial, a monumental day and huge testimony coming from David Pfluger. He's retired Minneapolis police, but he was a supervisor and a sergeant the day that George Floyd died, May 25th, and he offered opinion about the restraint used on George Floyd. And many of our panel, as I welcome them back, saying how damning that was, basically saying that once you had control of George Floyd, that should have ended it. You should not kept, have kept your knee on his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. So let's refresh the memory of our panel and you, our viewer, as we listen to that key testimony once again. Did he mention anything about putting his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck or back? No. And is the placement of a knee on a subject's neck uh, a use of force? Yes. A, a reportable type of force? Not necessarily. Okay. And why is that? Uh, for handcuffing somebody in a prone position or fighting with someone, it could happen where your knee ends up on their neck. Okay. For about how long? I, I guess whatever is reasonable. Okay. And which would be when? Uh, until you get control of the party, I guess. Okay. Control is in the person is then handcuffed? Handcuffed and not continuing to fight with you anymore. Okay. So once the person, once the subject is handcuffed and no longer resisting? Yes. At that point, uh, the restraint should stop. Yeah. Huge point for the prosecution right there. Reva Martin, talk to me about it. Yeah, this was a, a just a jaw-dropping jaw testimony uh, by that retired sergeant in support of the prosecution's case. Uh, I don't think the defense attorney necessarily knew it was coming. He didn't seem quite prepared for it. And when he did get, you know, when he finally caught up, he made an objection. We saw that sidebar that happened, and we saw him voir dire uh, the sergeant, trying to establish that this sergeant did not have sufficient information. He did not review sufficient information to be making a use of force determination. But it was already out, Mike. The jurors had already heard, really questioning whether the knee on the neck should have happened beyond a couple of seconds, because once Mr. Floyd was in handcuffs and on the ground, according to this sergeant, the restraint should have ended. And that's going to be very difficult, no matter what that defense attorney did afterwards, for the jurors to get that out of their head. So very, very shocking, startling uh, testimony in favor of the prosecution today. Because, Joey, the jurors, in their mind's eye, they're not only seeing Derek Chauvin's knee on the neck, which is number one, first and foremost here, but another officer on his back and another on his legs. Yeah, without question. So here's the key word, reasonableness, right? You heard the witness testify as to what is reasonable. Didn't give an indication of what that was, so you have to determine what is and what's not. Now, let's talk about that. We know from looking at the tape, the world knows and the world believes it's not reasonable. How does the defense backtrack and get out of that? What they do is they're pointing and they're not giving up on the issue of the crowd. The crowd's representing a distraction. And by virtue of the crowd, that has to factor into the issue of reasonableness because Chauvin and everyone has to deal with that. The problem, of course, Mike, we heard body cams. We heard no mention by any officer as it relates to being concerned about the crowd except saying get on the side. The other way that you deal with the issue of reasonableness is they're trying to attempt to is say, hey, isn't it true that when someone who's on or in some kind of drug-induced state, when they regain consciousness, they can be volatile, they can be a 
aggressive? That's a concern, isn't it? Yeah, it might be. So now the defense is using that to indicate that he was concerned that as Chauvin, that when Floyd regained consciousness, he could be volatile. That's what they're using to attack reasonableness, crowd control and the regaining of consciousness. Will it work? It seems like a really, really long shot. That's what they got. That's what they're going with, Mike. Bob, we got about a minute. Is that crowd argument resonating with you at all? Absolutely not. Not after this point in time. First of all, let's remember Mr. Floyd was in handcuffs. And these analogies, if there was a shootout and somebody was having a heart attack, fell flat on their face. This prosecutor did an excellent job. we got to give him credit for bringing each and every step of the way, dismantling this argument about the crowd, as well as the uh, drug intoxication. None of that makes a difference when one of their very own is saying that knee should have come off the neck. He basically confirmed what everyone else so far has testified to as to policy, and that goes to second-degree murder. We will talk further about this key testimony, but it also gets into how the officers dealt with him throughout this uh, event. They couldn't find a pulse, but yet remained on him to the point where paramedics are arriving, and some, one believed he was already dead. That huge testimony and much more coming up as we recap a huge day. Stay with us. Arthur and Sidebar, and this is key testimony here talking about the force used. Was it excessive use of force? Uh, what David Pflugers testified earlier is that, yes, you can use this maximal uh, restraint technique, but once you have control of the suspect, in this case it's George Floyd, the restraint should end. It should not last nine minutes and 29 seconds. I mean, Joey Jackson's with us, and Joey, I'll... Uh, apologize ahead of time I have to interrupt if we get back to court, but that's huge, isn't it? Without question, and absolutely just let me know. Look, it goes to the issue of reasonableness, and you hear every indication that this sergeant is laying out some of the protocols of the department, what's acceptable, what is not acceptable, what you can do. And what you can do is you use force, you get the subject under control, and then you relent. To the extent that you don't do that, it's unreasonable. To the extent that it's unreasonable, it's unlawful. To the extent that it's unlawful, you're convicted. So that's why they're at sidebar, because it's such an important portion of this trial. Yeah, I mean, from what it's saying, again, in layman's Terms, once you have George Floyd handcuffed and on the ground, that's it. There's no need to have three people on top of him. Is that what without you're hearing? Without question. Yeah. Absolutely, without question. And then, Mike, just one other point. The fact that he doesn't, during the initial call, he being his supervisor and Chauvin, Chauvin says nothing to his supervisor about using, uh, using his knee on the neck, says nothing about the duration. We could infer then, and the prosecution will ask the jury to infer, the reason he didn't tell his supervisor is because he knew it was wrong. And so this is a major portion of the trial. It goes to the issue of use of force and the appropriateness of use of force, and that's why, you know, he doesn't want the testimony that is the defense attorney for him to say that is the sergeant the very next thing which is can't do that well let's be honest it's already been damning testimony one other thing joey uh, well we have just a moment here uh that the sergeant talked about or retired police now positional asphyxia so the jury Absolutely. now has that in their mind as well that when somebody is on pavement basically face down chest on the pavement an officer should know that, that that could mean trouble, and they could have trouble breathing, and you have to get them on their side to get them relief, and not so, nine minutes later. So, Mike, that's an excellent point. And it's an excellent point because it means that Chauvin was on notice that he was trained with regard to this positional asphyxia. He knew the dangers inherent in it in the event that someone is laying in a prone or other position and that because of his training, his past experience, him knowing better would provide for him to turn him over as the pathway of breathing, right? Because you heard the retired sergeant, supervisor, indicate that that's what you do because you want to release it to allow them to breathe. The fact that Chauvin would know this and not do it is even more damning. Mm -hmm. Let's get Bob Bianchi in again. Bob, I apologize ahead of time. We have to interrupt. But your thoughts on this testimony and, and the gravity of it in this case? Devastating because, Mike, you got to go to what the jury is going to be read, the jury charge at the end of the day. And this is why cop cases are hard. The jury has to determine that the defendant intended to commit an assault in order to get that second-degree murder charge. What this witness is saying, one of their own, a supervisor who's gone through, they're saying that everything he did was essentially wrong and that he should not have continued to apply that force. That gets the prosecutor over that hurdle that it was reasonable police force as opposed to a second-degree murder. And it couldn't come out of the mouth of a better witness than a person who works within the department and is responsible 
responsible for ensuring that there's compliance with these policies. Mike, this is probably, I say right now, without question, the most devastating witness and may very well, by the end of the day, as far as the law is concerned, be the singular worst uh, witness against Derek Chauvin. Wow. Um, again, just to let everybody know, and we'll get back into court once they remove the headphones and start again, this MRT, oh, they're, they're starting it now, so we'll pick up a little bit later. Let's go back to court. Let's get Bob Bianchi in again. Bob, I apologize ahead of time. We have to interrupt. But your thoughts on this testimony and, and the gravity of it in this case? Devastating because, Mike, you got to go to what the jury is going to be read, the jury charge at the end of the day. And this is why cop cases are hard. The jury has to determine that the defendant intended to commit an assault in order to get that second degree murder charge. What this witness is saying, one of their own, a supervisor who's gone through, they're saying that everything he did was essentially wrong and that he should not have continued to apply that force. That gets the prosecutor over that hurdle that it was reasonable police force as opposed to a second degree murder. And it couldn't come out of the mouth of a better witness than a person who works within the department and is responsible responsible for ensuring that there's compliance with these policies. Mike, this is probably, I say right now, without question, the most devastating witness and may very well, by the end of the day, as far as the law is concerned, be the singular worst uh, witness against Derek Chauvin. Wow. Um, again, just to let everybody know, and we'll get back into court once they remove the headphones and start again, this MRT, oh, they're starting it now, so we'll pick up a little bit later. Let's go back to court.